All right, welcome back to Computer Science E259, XML with Java. This is lecture two, XML 1.1 and SACS 2.0.2. My name is David Malin. So it's in tonight's class that we really dive in deep into the material. And tonight is ostensibly about laying the foundation for the rest of the semester, because as this suggests, we really are going to start at the beginning with XML. What is it? Last week, we sort of tongue in cheek, waved our hands at the details of open bracket, closed bracket, and so forth. But what we'll do tonight is introduce some of the basic definitions, some of the fundamentals, not so much because they are interesting in and of themselves, but because so many of the questions that will come up throughout the semester and in coding up and using these APIs will ultimately be answered more often than not by looking back at these basic definitions. So as such, they'll persist throughout the course as something useful. In particular, we'll take a look tonight at something called SACS, the little qu a trivia from last week, the yeah, simple API for XML, and it is exactly that. It's, as we'll see, an event-based uh, API, which is pretty much the quickest and dirtiest way at actually using XML data in an application. So by class's end, you'll have a sense of just how to literally whip up pretty quickly an XML-oriented application, at least for some tasks, and what types of tasks this API will be appropriate for, we will dive into tonight. Recall that last week, did an introduction of the course. We glanced briefly at J2EE just to lay the foundation as to where we're going, pretty much around the mid-semester's point. And we talked about the what, who, when, how, and why of XML. And tonight we'll look more from a developer's perspective at some of the implementation details and basic definitions. So tonight we'll start with precisely that, move on to SACS itself, and then look more broadly at the API with which we'll really be playing the entire semester. It's something called JAXP, which is the Java API for XML processing, uh, specifically the latest version of it, and we'll look at what's pretty much a, an industry standard XML parser from the Apache Foundation. It's called Xerces. It's so standard, if you will, that it ships with Sun's JDK currently. We're simply going to use slightly newer versions of it in this course. Um, and it is uh, a fairly uh, well-performing and a fairly straightforward implementation of what it means to parse XML. We'll talk then generally what it means to parse in the first place, and then we'll conclude tonight by spending some time on project one, both its purposes and its structure, but specifically its code. So what you have among your handouts tonight is a printout of project one's source code, and we certainly won't look at it line by line tonight, but you'll at least by the end of tonight, if you haven't tried diving into the project yourself, you'll have a sense of where to begin, especially for you if you're more of the one of the neophytes in the class when it comes to Java programming, it at least won't seem such a daunting source, uh, source code tree that you've been handed. So with that said, any questions that have now come up? No? All right, so let's dive into it. So let's use this for the sake of discussion as a representative document. And I say representative because in this XML document, of which you have a printout tonight, we have most of the salient features of XML. And what those features are is what we'll tease apart right now. So this, on first glance, looks like it's what kind of document, what kind of database, if you will, being represented here as XML. So it's clearly related to students. It's a fairly small database. We've sort of waved our hands at dot, 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 at data that clearly will be redundant in structure, the second student and so forth. But we seem to have some interesting syntax here. And it's that syntax in particular that we'll tease apart, starting with the very top of this thing. So this is actually something that you'll see even in websites today. If you go to Internet Explorer's view source menu, in some websites you'll actually see this so-called XML declaration. And as you might infer, simply by glancing at it, this is sort of a, a, a clue to the program that's actually reading an XML document, whether it's a browser or some uh, more interesting piece of software, as to one, this document is XML in the first place. Two, what version of XML is it? And three, it gives an explicit mention of the encoding scheme used, which for a lot of applications isn't that interesting if you're pretty much just using ASCII characters anyway. But for non-romance uh, languages, for more interesting character sets, that in and of itself can be a useful uh, bit of information to pass whatever program is reading an XML document. So turns out it's purely optional. It really is just a hint to the program, and it's very often not even needed. Same goes true, uh, same goes in, say, an XHTML document. In a web page, it is by definition optional. But if it is there, it literally must appear at the top of the document. 
So these are sort of silly little trivia details, but details that will compel you to bang your head against the wall if you can't figure out for 20 minutes why your application is crashing. Well, it literally has to be the top of the document. First line, first character, if it's not there, that's an error. It's, uh, the reason for that is because if it's going to be a clue for the encoding type, well, you really have to tell the program with your very first byte what to expect. Um, with that said, uh, it's used to indicate the version, used to indicate the character encoding, and here are some representative ones. For the most part, we in this class, because we'll pretty much be dealing just with romance languages and that kind of data, we'll use UTF-8, UTF-16, one of the ISO standards. For our purposes in this course, it really doesn't matter. And so it's actually fine to omit it altogether for a lot of the applications we'll be playing with. A little more interesting, or at least a foreshadow of something we'll spend more time on later in the course, is this next element, the so-called doc type declaration. This syntax too is slightly different from the rest of an XML document in that it starts with not just a bracket, but the bang, an exclamation point. It's the doc type declaration that tells whatever program is reading this XML document, or even whichever human is reading this XML document, what standard the web page happens to conform to. So what do we mean by that? What, what does it mean for an XML document? even based on instinct, to conform to some standard. Put another way, have you seen uses of this doc type element, doc type declaration? Well, even, you probably haven't spent too much time on E259's website, let alone its source code just yet. But if we do go ahead and pull up E259's website, slowly sometimes on FAS, and we go to view source, notice that, one, we actually have behind the scenes of this website the XML declaration. Why? Eh, it's an XML course, we might as well throw it in there, frankly. The doc type declaration is slightly more interesting because more and more our browsers relying on these doc type declarations to adjust their behavior. So the second line of source code in the course's website, it's a little small I know, is doc type, HTML, and so forth. And what it indicates to the browser, i.e. in this case, is that this web page is written, if I haven't broken it since we first did it, in XHTML 1.0. And what that means is that every one of the tags and attributes and just general markup in this document does conform or should conform to the W3 standard as to what it means to be XHTML. That just means a bunch of people got together in a room one time and decided on a long document, a recommendation, to use the speak of last week, that simply says that blink is not a tag, but H1 is a tag, H2 is a tag, and so forth. And a doc type, as they're called, in addition to just being a standard as to what's a valid document, also specifies the order in which elements must appear sometimes, or what can be a child of what. So in fact, even though some of you at home, if you do a bit of web development, might have some kind of HTML or XHTML reference book next to you, technically you should be able to just pull up the W3's website and look at the doc type for XHTML to answer the question of the form, what children can this element have, or what attributes can this tag, take. It's all right in there. Now I say that in the context of web development these days, and this is sort of a, uh, a headache when it comes, comes to website development, many browsers these days have what it's called quirks mode. And quirks mode is simply a mode of behavior in the browser, like IE, that causes the browser to behave slightly differently, usually in a sort of backwards compatible way. And the browser decides whether or not to use this sort of uh, alternative behavior if a certain doc type declaration is present in the document. So if you ever are doing outside the scope of this course website development and you're pulling up your website in IE and in uh, Firefox and in Opera maybe and Safari and it's appearing differently on different computers, it's possible that one of the reasons for that is because either one, the manufacturers just in, uh, interpreted the spec differently, or two, the browser is just behaving in a different mode. And literally changing your doc type declaration in a web page these days actually has an undue amount of influence. And I say undue only because it's yet another variable to consider when dealing with the nightmare of UI design with web pages. But with that said, and for our purposes largely, a doc type declaration simply tells the program reading the document what standard this XML document conforms to. 
And in lecture seven, we'll we actually explain what we mean by DTD, and we'll look at some of the syntax, and we'll look at how you, a developer, might actually define a standard to which your own data or some third party's data must conform. But for now, this snippet here simply implies that this document, in some sense, conforms to a standard that's defined in a file called students.dtd. And it indicates an all-cap system because that standard, that file, students.dtd, is on the local file system, as opposed to at, say, some remote URL or embedded in the document itself. And it's one of these uh, curious exceptions in XML in that this, this declaration itself is not valid XML for a reason that may be uh, quickly self-evident uh, from the definition of XML itself, namely its elements. So elements, these are sort of the bread and butter of XML. When you talk about writing an XML document, pretty much you're talking about just writing up or interpreting the elements in that page. And in the context of making web pages, you probably refer to things as tags for the most part, and that's valid. So open bracket foo, close bracket is an open tag. An open bracket slash foo, close bracket, is a close tag. But as we said last week, collectively, everything in between that open and close tag, or that start and end tag, constitutes what we'll call an element. So it's more of a conceptual entity. It's more like an object in memory, if you think of it from more of a programmer's perspective. A few things to bear in mind. One, there is only one root element allowed in a document. So as if you look back on paper to our sort of mini students database, ignore the curious syntax up top, but starting with students on downward, we clearly have just one element of which everything else seems to be a descendant. And again, the indentation is more for human readability than anything else, but it sort of gives us a visual cue as to, a clue as to what the hierarchy here is. But when it comes to writing elements, what do you need to bear in mind? So one, they're sandwiched between what are called start tags and end tags. Um, you can have in an element specification of zero or more attributes, so long as those attributes are uniquely named. Um, you Define those attributes in a manner we'll spell out in just a moment, but worthy of note for now is this little detail, if only because it's slightly more restrictive than you might expect. So an element's name can certainly be something like foo, bar, baz, student, students, but the caveat is that any such name has to, one, start with a letter or underscore, and that's it for the starting character, and then it can have letters, hyphens, numbers, periods, and uh, underscores thereafter. So one of the sort of curious omissions, or at least things that you might trip over unintentionally, is they can't start with numbers, which sometimes can be a nuisance, or at least it's something to tuck away in mind, lest it frustrate you later. All right, so inside of these elements, and this sort of definition will become relevant as we begin talking about parsing and implementing my first parser, well, an element can have four different types of content. That is, four different types of stuff can appear between that start tag and the close tag. What are they? Well, one can just have element content. That is, our student's element can have a student child. Or in this case, a student element can have a status child. So the content of the student element in this case is just another element, in this case, status. They can instead have what we call parsed character data, aka PC data, and that's a an uh, acronym you'll see tossed around a lot. In layman's terms, just text. Like English words, letters, numbers, whatever. It's just parsed character data. So something like this, excerpted from our document, was open bracket uh, name, close bracket, PC data, and then the close tag. So the content of that element would be said to be purely um, parsed character data. And we'll come back to this more next week when we talk about DOM and exactly what it means to have a text node in a document. And the curious thing is when you come to talking about text in an XML document, you might just think that this Jim Bob is just a one, the sole child of an element called name. Turns out that that's sort of subject to interpretation. And you can't just assume that an XML document when represented in memory is going to tuck J-I-M space B-O-B all within the same object in memory. It could, in fact, get tucked away in seven different objects in memory, one for each letter. So a sort of curious thing we'll come back to. Mixed content, what does this mean? Well, this just means mixed stuff. So it can have element children, or it can have data interspersed in between. This is sort of a strange use of the notion, 
but in HTML or XHTML, you certainly see the notion of having nested inside of one element both parsed character data and elements themselves. Like, can you think of a very simple example or context in which HTML, you might have an open tag and a closed tag, but inside of that, in between those tags, you have both parsed character data, that is text, and other elements, but sort of intermingled in no sort of hierarchical way or not a pretty hierarchical way. Is your hand going up? Oh, sure, yep. Links, certainly, which are sort of like... Perfect. So you might have a whole paragraph of text in a web page, and just every once in a while you've got an, a bold-facing tag and a closed tag, or an a anchor reference, and then a close A tag, and so forth. So it might not necessarily have this very sort of clean... Uh, hierarchical structure, it might be interspersed, and that is valid XML. And just to be clear and to reemphasize last week's point, if you are writing web pages in XHTML, you're writing them already in XML. That's just an instance of XML. Finally, the easiest one, elements can have nothing, no content whatsoever. And the shorthand notation and the valid notation for writing an element that's got nothing nested inside of it is precisely this, where you have zero or more spaces in between the last letter of the name and this forward slash. A little XML trivia, which is trivia only until you have to yourself implement support for such. How else could you write that equivalently? Sure. Perfect. So I pretty much just open the element with dorm. And then immediately, literally with no spaces, for reasons we'll come back to in our discussion of doc types, you could close the tag. So this might make sense in the context of, and do just tell me if you have trouble seeing where I'm trying to write. Um, this makes sense certainly in the context of like a database where you want to have a placeholder for someone's dorm. But it's sort of acceptable if it's just not present because you don't know their address. A little stranger, though, in an instance of like XHTML would be to say something like this. Right? BR is the line break in HTML, as you probably know, and XHTML. And if you want to write valid XHTML, not just lazy, loosey-goosey sort of HTML, you actually need to close all tags in this way. But you don't normally see line breaks written in this way. You instead see them, obviously, as something a little cleaner. So why one way or the other? Why choose one approach over the other? Yeah? Conceptually, nothing can go between uh, a line break. Like, yeah. it, it is one thing. It's atomic. Perfect. It's a very atomic notion, this idea of a line break. And just conceptually, if only for sort of anal reasons, it just doesn't really make conceptual sense to have both the open tag and the closed tag but it is in fact perfectly valid. And so perfectly valid or equivalent that sometimes if you're using certain XML oriented software, well that software might take it upon itself after reading your document and if you go to save as or for the equivalent thereof, it might spit it out in a somewhat different way, which might conceptually be a bit annoying, but when it comes to the basic definitions, it's still equivalent, but perhaps uh, vulnerable to potential issues if you yourself insert spaces there unintentionally. And we'll come back to, and even the tail end of project one, as you've seen, for a whole zero points, you can read this two to three page add-on to project one that talks about some of the nuances of white space and XML, really for your own edification and extra challenge. But at the end of the day, little details like that can in fact change the behavior of your software, just not appreciating at least what it means to have white space there or not. So what about these attributes? And we got into a brief discussion last week about whether you go with an attribute for something or a child element uh, for some piece of data. Well, first of all, the syntax for an element is probably pretty familiar. So you've got the name of the element, equal sign, and then open quote, some stuff, close quote. The quotes can be either a pair of single quotes or double quotes. You can use both if you want to nest one in between the other. Um, you can have zero or more spaces around the equal sign. So it doesn't have to look as pretty as that. You could put a whole bunch of line breaks in there, and by definition, it doesn't matter. But to the human, it's probably a bit of a nuisance. But just realize that that's perhaps the cleanest way of writing it, but it can appear different ways. Again, for the most part, white space is irrelevant in XML, or at least can be made to be irrelevant to your application. And that's, again, when we'll come back to DTDs. Just to know, the names are pretty 
pretty identical to that for elements. Must start with a letter or underscore, and then the rest of the characters can be as described there. The values. So we'll get to the notion of data types in XML, even though, curiously enough, at the end of the day, everything in XML document is just text. So it's really a conceptual sort of data typing that we'll impose on XML eventually when it comes to DTDs and schemas in the course. For the most part now, we'll assume that val attributes values are just text. And maybe in the context of Java code, you might uh, call integer.parseInt to convert what's really a string into its numeric equivalent. But for the most part, you can represent, um, you, it, for the most part, you represent all such data as text and we'll convert it when necessary. Um, only thing to bear in mind is that these are pretty much the only two gotchas. The values of an attribute can't have open bracket and they can't have ampersands. The first one's perhaps somewhat obvious. Why would it be a little strange to allow open brackets within the double quotes? Yeah. Right. It, it would confuse the most naive of parsers that inside of this attribute is some other element. And we did say last week that the one thing you can't have with attributes is any sort of hierarchy. They are themselves very atomic. Could you implement a parser that knows that a, an open bracket is acceptable within the confines of a quoted string that is ultimately the value of an attribute? Absolutely, but the spec does not allow for such. So it's somewhat useful, but perhaps somewhat of a downside. The ampersand, though, why is that problematic by itself? Yeah, exactly. So actually, it's uh, still two slides away, but you've probably seen in the world of web development things like uh, ampersand NBSP semicolon for non-breaking space. You might have had to look up similar characters to put like a copyright symbol at the bottom of a web page or similar in M dash and N dash, those sorts of things for which there's no key on the keyboard. Well, that's uh, the ampersand is used to demark XML entities which are like little macros or little ways of very explicitly stating what character you want to output. So to have one by itself is not in fact acceptable since the parser by nature will assume that it's the start of an entity. And if there is no entity there, the parser should by definition abort or choke or err in some way. PC data, just to spell it out. So Jim Bob was our example of PC data, though there was a bit more in that document. It's text that appears as the content of an element. Inside of PC data can be these things called entities, open uh, ampersand something semicolon. And this is why it's called parsed character data. An XML program like the one you'll be working with in project one is supposed to parse the individual characters in PC data so as to convert, for instance, in some sense, such entities to their actual uh, visual equivalents, for instance. Little, so that's sort of a higher level description of it, but that's the idea. The text content in a PC data section will actually be parsed for validity or for acceptable, acceptability with respect to the spec. And again, can't contain those two mis potentially misleading characters. The only entities you should vaguely be familiar with in XML, if only so that you know which ones don't exist, are these five. Ampersand, or ampersand AMP, which itself gives you an ampersand. Uh, ampersand LT gives you, as you probably know from HTML. Sorry? Uh, less uh, the less than symbol. GT gives you the greater than symbol. APOS apostrophe if you need that, especially inside of quotes if you can't just uh, flank the single quotes with double quotes if you'll run out of sort of nesting options, and then double quotes itself. Those are the only five that exist, and a curious omission given how text-oriented XML sort of is by nature is that non-breaking space entity. So in your XML documents, it's very common to store something like HTML or text that might ultimately be rendered in a web page. And so using something like NBSP, it's very reasonable. And the frustrating thing in this space, as you yourself, I think, will experience this semester, is that just like in the world of browsers, there's a lot of software out there, even the industry standard software, that tends to stray from the spec, even as the world has sort of learned the hard way, the lessons of not implementing specs precisely, given the frustrations developers later feel, um, which is to say a program like Xerces, this parser will use, will not allow you to use NBSP in an XML document unless you define it yourself in advance. And that's correct behavior. 
programs like Stylus, which is a sort of WYSIWYG program that we'll use in demonstrations during the course. It's similar to XML Spy, if you're familiar with that product. If you're familiar with neither, great, we'll get to both of them in the course. Stylus, for instance, though, is a little more forgiving and it bends the rules. So if your XML document has NBSP and you haven't defined it explicitly, eh, they let it slide and your, your application or your document works within Stylus. And it's these stupid little features that ultimately can be a bit of a development headache because you just don't know necessarily what to expect, but at least coming back to the basic definitions will tell you what you should expect even if uh, such might not prove to be the case. So how do you declare them? Well, at the top of your document, among other places, you can simply say open bracket bang entity, define the, th the name of the entity, and then in quotes specify like the, um, the Unicode uh, number for the character you want to represent. So this is a useful one, if any, to sometimes copy and paste into future documents in the course, the top of your document so that you yourself can use NBSP in a document. And that's particularly useful when we get to XSLT in a couple of weeks, which is a very useful language that we'll use all, largely in the context of generating web pages dynamically, which is to say if you're going to use a language like XSLT to generate web pages dynamically, it sort of stands to reason that you'd want to generate sometimes non-breaking spaces. But if you want to do that with XSLT, you can't use NBSP in the XSLT because it is XML and so hence the motivation for even talking about this in the first place, because you'll need to define it if you actually want to use it. And you can do more interesting things like this guy with this hex code to get, for instance, the copyright symbol. But you can pretty much Google for an online reference for what codes you might need to type if you want to make use of them in your document. Finally, C data. In contrast to parsed character data, there is character data, which effectively is unparsed. This is a useful thing to know, though you want to be wary not to use it for reasons of laziness. If you have content, whether it's HTML content or maybe JavaScript content or just some kind of content that itself might contain open bracket or might contain ampersands as JavaScript, for instance, might, but you want to use XML to actually transfer that data down to a browser or down to some application, you probably don't want the XML software actually parsing that document and realizing, whoa, you can't use less than in your JavaScript documents. This document is thus invalid. Well, to work around that, you can simply escape effectively content that you don't want to be parsed, but you just want to be passed through raw because you're trusting that the recipient application will be okay with its rawness and the fact that it hasn't been checked for consistency with XML. So the first line sort of sums it up. It's just parsed in one chunk by the parser, and then the parser moves on to the next chunk of data. And that, too, is a useful construct. And to be honest, for like six or so years to this day, I always have to look up the syntax for this particular declaration. Open bracket, bang, open square bracket, seed data, open square bracket, content, square bracket, square bracket, angled bracket. Right? It's, if you ever needed to come up with a sequence of characters that's very unlikely to appear in an English sentence, that's one of them. It's also, as a result, I think, a little hard to remember. So don't, don't feel so bad if you two are copying and pasting from your own old work or old lecture slides. Oh, small white lie. There is one more guy. Comments. And these are uh, not so much a fun addition because you're probably familiar with them anyway. But just like in HTML, if you want to be able to uh, include comments in a document that are completely ignored by the receiving application. Syntax is just like you've seen in web pages. The only gotcha with these, which similarly is a bit of a nuisance, they cannot inside themselves have hyphen, hyphen, which is only a new, particularly a nuisance if you, for instance, are in the habit of commenting out some code and then you want to comment out some more code. Well, you can't do it as in other languages like uh, C because you have the same sequence of characters nested inside the expected sequence for a comment. So just beware. And I totally misset expectations. There's one more element to that representative document, and those are processing instructions. And we in the course will use these the least um, only because there are, they're useful in some contexts, but I wouldn't say they're a particular popular feature of XML. The, one of the very first few lines of our representative document had this curious syntax, open bracket, question mark, and then some name, in this case, student DB, space, and then some other content. Well, processing instruction 
is similar in spirit to a comment, which we just saw, but it is in fact processed or parsed by the receiving application. That is to say, PIs or processing instructions are really used as a way in XML of providing hints or instructions to the receiving application as to how it should behave. The curious thing is that even though a convention is with PIs to give them a name like this, which you must to meet the spec, open bracket question mark name, everything after that space can appear pretty much in any way. It does not have to look like an attribute value pair. That is to say what the receiving application will receive is literally D-I-S-P-L-A-Y-D-E-S-C equal sign quote T-R-U-E quote but it won't receive it in any kind of parsed form. It won't receive it as a conceptual object like an attribute that has a value. It literally will receive one long string. It's therefore up to the receiving application to itself parse that otherwise arbitrary string. And perhaps for that reason are they a bit of a nuisance potentially because you yourself have to sort of reinvent that wheel and parse the instruction yourself. But they are used sometimes and one thing you can use them for as we'll do in a couple of weeks time is that uh, browsers like Internet Explorer um, at least as of version 6.0 and I presume we'll test it out with 7.0 actually have a built-in XSLT rendering engine, which is to say you can hand to Internet Explorer both an XML document and this thing called an XSLT document and tell the browser to apply that XSLT to the XML document. Similar in spirit to how browsers obviously apply CSS style sheets to HTML documents. The means by which you tell a browser like IE to what to apply to what is by embedding in your XML document one of these PIs. And we'll see the syntax for it in two weeks. And it's sort of a cryptic looking string that ultimately just tells IE what XSLT document to use to process the XML file that contains the PI. So long story short, no they exist. We'll see in the API how you can make use of them. Um, whether or not you ultimately use them or need them is entirely up, to, uh, up for debate and context sensitive. So with that said, questions on just some of these basic fundamentals. I mean, that is XML in a nutshell. Yeah? Back on the entities page, what's your defining like as ESP? Mm-hmm. And after you put that one in your defining, then can you use that percent ESP that you offer? Exactly. Yes, exactly. The idea is that if you paste something like this toward the top of your document to declare effectively what, it, what ampersand NBSP semicolon should mean, as soon as you're done writing this tag and write that close, bracket, you can start using that entity in the rest of your document. That's exactly the idea. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, could you go over sure. what the last one means again? Uh, oh, this just means you can't have circularity. So you can't say that NBSP means ampersand NBSP. Okay. So it's sort of there for thoroughness, not because you might want to do that. Okay. Yeah. You said it could be used for macros. So is there anything more than just like a simple substitution of like one character for NBSP? Yeah, so good, good, good to pick up on that. So they can be used as macros in the sense that they don't need to be as simple as this between quotes. You can, as sort of a lazy man's approach to copy and paste or defining constants of sorts, you can put more than something that looks like that. You could put an arbitrary string such that henceforth, anytime you say ampersand NBSP semicolon, you don't get this Unicode equivalent. You get the string, the quick brown fox jumps over a lazy dog. And that's perhaps useful if you just want to be able to change your document in one place and have the effect of changing it elsewhere once it's processed by an application. I wouldn't say that you see that use very often. It's sort of possible, but perhaps not very conventional. But good to pick up on that. Yes, they would typically be, um, they either have to be or typically be, I'd have to check the spec myself at the top of the document. And I hedge only because I, only myself put them at the top. Other questions? Okay, so it's all fine and good to sort of know what XML is, but let's try to actually make use of this knowledge and start looking at some code and some APIs. And really, once you know what XML is, well, certainly you could write it up with Microsoft Notepad and write an XML document, and that's fine, but what can you actually do with it? In other words, how can we start using XML in actual software? Well, the API promised for tonight's first discussion is this simple API for XML 
parsing or processing. The latest version is 2.0.2, and that's pretty much what the software off the shelf these days will support, including the JDK. Let's now hone in on a, a simpler representative document, which will be illustrative of how this API works. This sample XML document, we're throwing away all those other features and really focusing on the core features, which really are elements, text, and attributes. And that's what you'll typically use this kind of markup for. Well, what does it mean to actually parse this document? Well, just in English or in layman's terms, or maybe software developer's terms, what does it mean to parse a document? Yeah. It means to scan characters one by one, group them into lexical entities, which means a something which has a meaning. Mm -hmm. assign them to a structure, some kind of programmatic structure which defines the structure of some kind of computation. Something like that. Okay, good. And just to reiterate and summarize, it's the process of sort of analyzing a file character by character, clustering related characters that collectively form some conceptual or lexical entity, like a start tag, for instance, and then actually proceeding to do something with those entities, uh, making sure, for instance, that they adhere to some standard and make not only syntactical sense, but logical sense, or sense with respect to some specification, or DTD, as the jargon we've been using tonight. So with that said, let's assume for the moment that we have the ability to parse a document. That is, we've already got some black box that can take an XML document and understand what it means to be a start tag. Right? What is a start tag? It's an open bracket, character, 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 close bracket. We as the developer probably don't care about knowing when the pro software that we're relying upon to implement a more interesting application reads the open bracket and reads the first character. And just let me know when you're done parsing that whole start tag and tell me what start tag you've encountered. Why? Well, what I'm interested in, I being the developer, am in, I'm interested in the ID numbers of all the students in the database. So conceptually, I might just be interested in knowing when the black box software that I'm relying upon as a module or like a, a library that I'm using encounters the items or the conceptual entities of interest. And those items of interest in XML speak are typically going to be the elements and their names and the attributes associated thereto, and also the actual text content, the PC data or C data of the document. So that is precisely what SACS does for us. If you have a program called a parser that implements the SACS API, what that means is you can use that API or an implementation thereof in your own software, say, API, go parse, or library, go parse this XML document, and just let me know when you encounter things of interest to me. And the means by which you do that is that you use an event-based handling mechanism. You pretty much say to that parser, not only is this the file I want you to parse, but I want you to call me back, you know, sort of by telephone or in programming speak, by way of methods that I'm going to implement, but you're going to call when you encounter items of interest. In other words, parser, when you encounter the start tag, please call this method. When you encounter a close tag, please call this method. When you encounter a comment, please call this method. So you proactively tell the parser, one, the file you want it to process, but two, the callbacks you want it to invoke. And that's what SACS does. It literally calls you by way of the methods you've told it to use, and then what you do with the received data the name of the element, the list of attributes, is entirely up to you, the developer. So in the context of our sample document, let's take a look at a sort of uh, faux animation of how this process works, and then we'll translate it to actual code. What we have, we'll have here in a moment, and you already see the spoiled end result in your printout, is this will be our XML document appearing character by character as though we were the parser reading it, character by character. And what we're going to see down here is what we'll call a content handler. And this is the nomenclature that the JAXP API, that is the API we'll be using, uses to describe something that implements the SACS API. That is to say, if you want to implement, if you want to support or use the SACS API and have your events, uh, your event handles called, well, you need to implement the interface called content handler. So what we'll see here is what's going on inside of my code vis-a-vis -vis what's going on inside that black box, the parser. So with that said, the very first thing 
a sax parser will do upon parsing a document is say, here's the start of the document. Doesn't even start reading the document per se, it just calls an event handler that I have probably informed it of by convention called start document and what I, how I implement that method, entirely up to me. And again, we'll see a real world instance of this in a moment. The next thing the parser is going to encounter when parsing a file is obviously what? The very first line, very first character in the document. And so the uh, parser is going to encounter open bracket followed by S-T-U-D-E-N-T-S. And then, well, let's see. So and I'm going to do the, the way the animation is structured is sort of uh, runs in parallel, if you will. So the moment that students is parsed, the parser already knows that the next thing it is going to call me back on is a method that we'll call by convention start elements. The first parameter argument to this method is going to be quote unquote students. That is to say the parser is going to inform me of the name of the element it's parsing. But what might the parser continue to detect in the parsing of this file? And attributes. So I'm sort of, again, it's running in parallel because what I'm also going to receive, having implemented this start element handler, is a list, linked list, an array, whatever, of those attributes. And in this case, we had an attribute, we had no attributes in the student element, or in the student's element. And so this method is ready to be complete. And so I receive that event by way of this callback start element. And what I now do with this name and this null list of attributes, totally up to me. The parser has already forgotten that it invoked that, though small white lie. Is the start element the same thing as the root element? Not necessarily. Is the start element the same thing as the root element? It is the very first time an element is encountered, but this same method start element is called for every element. So it would be up to your software to keep count of, for instance, how many elements you've encountered so that when your counter is at zero or one, you know this is the first. But there's no uh, inherent cue that it is. Yeah? So this start document, start element, the user defined are implemented, you do the implementation, but they already exist in the SACS API? Correct. That is to say, if you're running software that is to use the SACS API, you need to implement zero or more of these callback methods. And probably more, one or more, otherwise you're, doing no, you're achieving nothing. Um, there are, we'll pull up the API because there's a few more esoteric callbacks that tend not to be used very often, but I believe a couple of them do uh, relate to the encoding of the document. I think. I'll have to check myself. The next thing encountered in that document, recall, was some white space. We're going to ignore white space for now. We'll come back to that eventually, but open bracket. We just pretty printed with the white space. So that indicates the start of an element. So we, oh, ah, I'm forgetting my own animation here. We're not going to forget the characters that have been encountered because what in fact was just encountered, well even though you don't see it quite explicitly, really there's a backslash n there followed by four or so white spaces or a tab character depending on what this thing really is. And so in fact there is in the SACS API an event handler called characters which hands to me, the software that's implemented it, a single argument and that argument is a string, a Java string, of the characters encountered. So what I'm going to receive in my callback is backslash n, space, 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 space. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so and this is, it, it's a fine line to walk between overstating the importance of white space and waving one's hands at it. The short of it is that white space in an XML document is important and it's preserved unless you instruct the parser to ignore it explicitly. And you typically do that by providing the parser with one of those things called a DTD or a schema. And again, if you're, if you're particularly curious about this or want to foreshadow, at the end of project one is, sort of, is an explanation of what it means to be quote unquote ignorable white space or significant white space. But in this case, by default, it's assumed to be significant and you receive it. If you want to ignore it, that's your prerogative as the developer. The next thing that's going to be encountered though, because we know upon reading this open bracket that's clearly the start of an element or it's a, a syntactical error, if it's anything else, we seem to have encountered the start element, the starting element for students. And this time recall from our representative document, we did in fact have an attribute, namely its 
ID number. And so that's going to be passed to my start element event handler as a list, an array, something like that. We're using really pseudocode here, but I'm borrowing the names from the API. Was there anything else after 0001? No, it was just it was an atomic element or a singleton of sorts, an empty element, as it's called, because it has no textual or uh, element-based children. And so this method is complete and immediately is called an event handler called end element. And it's called so that you, the programmer, can keep track of what elements being closed and opened. It's called with a single argument, namely the name of the element that's been called. And at least in our simplified pseudocode here. Finally, we encounter again an open bracket. What's the next, without looking down, the next method that's going to be invoked? Good, so you're better than I. So the characters event handler gets invoked again because what characters have we just encountered? A single would seem backslash n, so that's going to be passed in as our argument. Now we encounter that open bracket. The open bracket, of course, signifies the start of a tag, an open or closed tag, because we see the forward slash and then the name of some element. We know that it's, in fact, end element that's going to be called this time. And that was the end of our representative document, assuming we didn't hit enter a bunch of times. Is that the end of our events? There's going to be one more, as you might have seen or might have guessed. End yeah, end document. So that you, the, the programmer, have a finality of parsing and know that the parsing is now, in fact, complete. Start element student. Yep, good. Good point. So my pseudocode has a bit of a typo. We should have a parenthesis there. I'll fix that in the online example. But that anyway is not the valid code anyway, just to have the squigglies there. Yeah, question? Exactly. So this, again, is just an arbitrary pseudocode notation, but conceptually, and I think in project one where I give a more complicated example than the, just this three tag example, you would simply treat these as tuples here. So you would put comma, open paren, close paren, and then another attribute value pair inside. But again, it's completely arbitrary. It's just meant to be a simple pseudocode. Other questions? Other questions? All right, so let's take a look at a demo. What I will try to do in each of the lectures, anytime we have demo code, is I'll strip out usually my own comments from the code at the screen so that it's actually an interesting intellectual stimulation to look through code sometimes and consider what exactly it's doing. But for your own reference and for your at-home reference, what you'll often find is that the printouts of code, for instance, tonight's smaller printout of code, I did actually include my inline comments. So you don't yourself necessarily have to scribble uh, furiously to include everything, but I think it's a little more stimulating if we sort of look through and think through some of the code at the board rather than just walking you through what you could certainly read on your own. So with that said, what is linked on the course's website this week and in future weeks are all of the examples that at least have been pre-prepared for class. And sometimes I might toss up additional examples as as your questions govern if we whip up additional examples in class. But for instance, we'll always release them not only as a PDF that you can print out like you've received tonight, but as a tarball, a zip file, and then also just a directory listing. So tonight we have two such prefabbed examples, one called Sax Demo and another called Sax Demo 2, both of which are going to highlight the actual use now of the Sax API. So with that said, if you in the future want to play with this code on your own, you can certainly download it from the website and run it at your own command prompt on Mac OS, Windows, Linux, and so forth. Typically, if you've configured your machine in accordance with the appendix for the most recent project, it should just work. If you type the same commands that I type in lecture, um, it's possible on occasion you might have to adjust your own class path if I'm doing something that's not itself expected of you in the project, but by all means ask via the listserv. But similarly, can you simply copy at the command line all of those files? And notice that the files follow a similar structure to what you probably already typed for project one. Everything's in the distribution directory, slash lectures, slash number, and so forth. And you should also um, 
you can always certainly pull that up to find out. So that is to say you could just use the cp command and copy it over if you're familiar. So I've already done that in advance in my own FAS account. So tonight I've downloaded not only project one but also examples two for tonight. Inside the examples two directory now we have these two files, sax demo and sax demo two. So let's take a glance at sax demo dot java. This program ultimately is a use of the SAX API to do something very simple to keep this consistent this demonstration with what we just did verbally the goal I had in mind in whipping up SAX demo was to write a Java program that parses an actual XML document and displays on the screen that same pseudocode version of the SAX events that were fired so in other words what we're about to do with this code is ourselves implement all of the event handlers we care about in the SAX API we're going to register our implementation with the parser and tell that parser what name file, what XML file to parse. That parser then, then we're going to use the one that you know, came with the JDK, is going to call those methods in turn every time it encounters and the start of an element, the end of an element, the start of the document, characters, and so forth. And what my implementations of those methods are going to do, quite simply, is just use system.out.print and print the pseudocode that corresponds to the SAX event fire so that we can literally can see the SAX API in use. So with that said, the main method here is really what's going to bootstrap that process. So notice this is my main method. We're going to do a bit of error checking at the top. And I know this is a slightly washed out visible in the back. OK, and you have the printouts as well. So we're just going to check the argument length. The usage of this program is just going to expect the name of the file on the command line to parse. After we've gotten that out of the way, I'm going to grab the name of the file. Then I'm going to try to do the following. And if you're not terribly familiar with or accustomed to using try catch blocks handling exceptions, get used to it. Because most of these APIs make heavy use of exception handling to detect errors. And if this too is sort of outside the scope of your Java familiarity, not at all hard to pick up either by chatting with me or really just inferring from some of these examples or Googling the same online. So let's focus on the guts of this little program. Notice it's four lines long at the end of the day. One, two, three, four. All the rest was just new, annoying startup stuff. So what's the first line here? If you want to use the SAX API in the context of Java, well, what you're going to make use of is the factory mechanism. And this is to say to instantiate your SAX parser, you're going to simply use these two lines of code. And literally, henceforth, if you want to make use of this using the same API, copy-paste these two lines. And what you get at the end of the second line is, in a reference called parser, a reference to, as you might guess, a SAX parser. So these two lines together hand me back a reference to a SAX parser, that thing we've been calling a black box of sorts. What do I next do? Well, one, I'm going to instantiate an object of myself. And this was just sort of a clean way of containing this whole demonstration within one file. So my one file actually implements that interface called content handler, but itself has a main method so that we have sort of a, a driver program with which to test it. And what I said might have been slightly misleading a second ago. I said that this demo, saxdemo.java, implements that content handler interface. Well, that's true, but it seems to do it indirectly. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll look at this by way of the Java doc in a moment, because this is sort of a, a useful framework or model to follow typically, especially when using APIs like these. SAX demo is, in fact, implementing the content handler interface that we alluded to earlier. And we'll look at the API for that, the Java doc for that in a moment. But it turns out that with the JDK and with the API itself comes a null implementation of that interface. That is to say, even though we only saw a moment ago and discussed the characters, start document, start element, end document, and end element event handlers, there's actually a bunch more, maybe a dozen or more, some of them more esoteric than those that you typically wouldn't want to use anyway. But in Java, as you know, if you implement an interface, you can't just implement the parts of it you want. You either implement the interface or you don't. Fortunately, if you don't care about some method, you have to implement it. But that's an implementation. Open squiggly, close squiggly. So what the, uh, what the API comes with is a class called default handler, 
that does implement this interface called content handler, but every one of its methods is implemented as those two characters. What this means for us is that it's sort of a convenience that we can just extend that guy rather than implementing the actual interface because this way by extending default handler that already has null implementations of all the methods we can now by way of inheritance polymorphic behavior simply override those implementations by implementing the methods we care about and everything else just has no behavior whatsoever because of its predefined implementation so it's a useful trick but just realize the distinction we'll highlight that by way of the java doc so we promised that this thing was a content handler, and it is. This class, Sax Demo, extends default handler, which in turn implements content handler. So when I do this, Sax Demo handler gets new Sax Demo, what I now have is a reference to an instance of myself. That is to say, I have a reference to a so called content handler. So it is that reference and the name of the file that I am going to pass to that black box's parse method. And that's it. In four lines of code, you have a program that uses the SACS API. Well, where is the software? Where is the application? Well, it's in the implementation of one or more of those API methods. So this is to say, in this line of code, this starts the whole process. That SACS parser, henceforth, will start parsing the XML document, top to bottom, left to right, and every time it encounters an entity of interest, the start of an element, the end of an element, the attributes, and so forth, it's going to call you by way of the methods that you registered with it by way of this call. Where are those methods implemented? Well, down below. Now, the signatures for some of these methods are a little intimidating because, again, the pseudocode we used a moment ago really honed in only on the interesting stuff and not on some of the distractions. So technically, and this is copy-pasted from the API itself, technically the start element method takes four different parameters, which are defined here. The short of it is that the one we care about tonight is the one called QName. And when we get to our discussion in this class of namespaces, then some of those other arguments will make more sense. But for now, we're going to ignore them. But they just have to do with a more uh, explicit mention of what elements you mean in the document. And namespace is perhaps a concept you're familiar with from other languages anyway. A question? Um. Yes, I would say that, to, to summarize, it's the parser that's handling the low-level details, the syntactical details, and only calling you back when it's encountered something that makes semantic sense, which, and by semantic, we mean like the start of an element, which has a sort of higher level definition in our mind. So the parser really is down here, if you think of things as being built on top of one another, whereas we care about what these elements are called and what attributes they have. I don't really care that an attribute is implemented with the thing we know as open bracket. That to me is just metadata that's completely uninteresting. So yeah, that would be a nice summary of the distinction. So start element, and this code looks more complicated than it really needs to be, but this is just very boring Java code that simply takes the name of the element and the list of attributes, we'll come back to this after break, attributes is just a class or an interface that gives you, that represents attributes as like a linked list or as an array. And what I'm literally doing, doing in this code is printing out that same pseudocode that we saw before, start element, open paren, the name of the element in between quotes, close quote, comma, open squiggly. And what this for loop simply does is it iterates over that list of attributes with fairly familiar probably for loop syntax and prints for each of them the name of the attribute followed by, as you might expect, an, uh, where is that? sorry, yep, so followed by a comma, followed by the value of the attribute, followed by close parenthesis. Then, as promised earlier, if we have multiple such attribute value pairs, we just st stamp a bunch of commas in between them. And then when we're finally done enumerating all of those attributes, close squiggly bracket. So again, complicated code, but none of this really fundamentally has to do with the SACS API. This is just a Java implementation of the pseudocode printing that we looked at 
in the PowerPoint slide. How did we implement end elements? Well, end element, recall, was pretty darn simple. The pseudocode for that was just end element, open parenthesis, name. So similarly, does the end element event handler get this sort of scary signature? The only thing of interest for now is just going to be that Q name, the qualified name, which really is just the name of the element. What were a couple of the other events we saw in our pseudocode demo? So characters, and let's pluck off the easier ones first. What were the two easiest ones? Start document, so these should all be in alphabetical order. Start document, terribly boring. In fact, it doesn't even take any arguments because it's just the start of the document or not. End document, similarly, is pretty boring. So the last one of interest is the characters one. And recall that all we did for our pseudocode to denote that characters were being outputted is characters, parenthesis, the string, close parenthesis. So let's pause here for five minutes, take a break, um, and I'll be up here if you'd like to come up with any one-on-one -on -one questions. All right, so you've seen the code. Why don't we take a look at this thing in action? So conceptually, what should we expect after, one, compiling this code, simple as Java C of file name, put it up top, I'm going to run Java of uh, Sax demo. And what I'm going to run it on, let's show you the file first. I'm going to steal from our project one directory, the samples directory's XML directory, which as you may have seen already, as you may have seen already, contains eight files. The first one of which is pretty simple. The second one of which is similarly pretty simple but has a bit more structure. The third of which, slightly more interesting in that it has a space as the first character, and they get slightly more interesting after that. And generally, each represent some introduction of some new characteristic of the file that will be of interest to you when writing the rest of the parser. So what I'm going to do now is run Java of Sax demo on xml1.xml, which was just open foo, close foo. What should I expect to see upon hitting enter based on the code we walked through? Start document, start element, uh, start element, sorry, end element, and document. So it should be pretty simple. There were no attributes. It didn't even look like there were any characters in there. And that is, in fact, what we get. And again, this is just pseudocode. And so what our program has done is generated the pseudocode that we used for the sake of discussion earlier. If we instead look at example two, this file is a little more structure. So just again, in, in high level English, start document, start element, ah, characters, good. So character, so start element, characters, start element, characters, end element, characters, end element. All right, so let's take a look. Java of Sax demo on XML, 2.xml, enter. Okay, it's pretty messy though, because I've simply outputted the literal backslash n. So uh, I'll steal the thunder of Sax Demo 2. All Sax Demo 2 does is it just escapes those things so that you actually see backslash n. Just makes things a little prettier. In fact, we can go ahead and run that on the same example without even looking at the code. Sax Demo 2 on XML of file 2 just looks, oh, I broke the code earlier, looks a little broken. Should be a backslash in there because in the regular in the replacement text I seem to have changed in my account, but I believe your copy is correct. I removed one of these replace alls. Yep. Okay. So you didn't see that little behavior behind the curtain. Now let's rerun that command and voila! Now you have the beautified version of the same. And all it does again is it explicitly shows you the backslash ends to keep things a little prettier. So illustrative, not a terribly useful application if all you're doing is throwing up flags saying event, 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 but hopefully what it illustrates is how this API is working. And what we'll see in a bit in the context of, say, Project 1 is how you might make use of this API and some of the applications for which this API might, must, uh, might be useful. So let's tease apart now some of the API itself. 
the top of this page, starting off in this course certainly could be another opportunity to copy paste, just so that you're familiar with or know what packages you probably want to import so that you have access to the API. What I've tried to do is pretty much only import ones explicitly that we need, rather than waving my hands at it and just saying dot star. So you should usually see at the top of the file exactly the interfaces or classes being used. So what are the packages that we're pretty much focusing on tonight? org.xml.sax, as you might guess, javax.xml.parsers, and collectively these things implement these APIs we've been describing as the SACS API, which is a subset of the JAXP API. And next week, per the syllabus, we'll be looking at the DOM API. That, too, is another subset of JAXP. So one of the two major components of JAXP is SACS and DOM. So we're plucking off one of those tonight and the other one next week. And there's a little bit more to JAXP as well. Um, what's more of interest, perhaps, is looking at those four lines of code that really got things going. So this is perhaps something some of you might not be used to, this idea of using a factory. This isn't a JAXP specific thing, but it's sort of a framework increasingly used in sort of large APIs like JAXP. Normally, when, especially if you have just a, a limited experience with Java, if you want an instance of a class, what do you do? Just instantiate it, right? So yeah, the reference equals new foo, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. Well, that's fine if you know in advance that you specifically want an instance of the foo class. When it comes to fairly complicated APIs that are often constant in flux, or being modified, or generally being re-implemented underneath the hood, this so-called factory framework is a useful thing, and it usually means using two lines of code instead of one to achieve the same effect. What it really does is it creates an additional layer of abstraction between you and the actual objects you're instantiating. By not saying that I want a new space sax parser, but instead saying, I want a factory, and then I want the factory to call its new SACS parser, parser uh, method. What that does is it doesn't tie my software to a particularly named implementation of a SACS parser. That is to say, often by way of Java properties and other similar configurations, you can actually change the type of object that spit out of the factory without actually breaking existing code. It simply allows you to re-implement things, perhaps with completely different class names, but you only need to change the factory. You don't need to change the actual code that uses it. But you've tied it to a particular factory. Absolutely. You've tied it to a particular factory. And there's only so, many, so much distance you can put between you and actual library code. Exactly. This is more, uh, the advantage of this is, more, yes, that works, but it's more so that you can change the implementation without breaking extant code. So that this, in the current version of Xerxes, the parser that we're using in the course, you might actually be getting back a reference to a Jim Bob parser, because Jim Bob was the guy who implemented this particular version of the SAX parser. But with the next release of Xerxes, you might actually get an, an instance of Fred's parser, the only people that know about that change, though, are, for instance, the, Sun, the folks at Sun or at Apache who actually change the, type, the implementation of these factory methods. Your code continues to function, but perhaps is better performing because Fred was a better coder than Jim. So then regardless of what's going on underneath, you would typically use those two lines? Those two lines or string them together as one if you're willing to, um, ex uh, if you're willing to catch the exception that might ensue. Other questions? All right, so what is this API actually? So one of the links with which you should get quite familiar and friendly is the one for the JAXP API. So that again, per last week, the top section of the course website's resources page should be a wonderful one-stop place to come for information when writing your own code or reviewing code perhaps that we've looked at in class. The second link here, the Java API for XML processing, JAXP, is the Java doc for this API that we've already now just dived into. So it's a pretty big API. There's a whole bunch of classes and interfaces and a whole bunch of packages. Not so important to 
know exactly what's in all of these. And really, we're only going to use what we need to out of this API. But you should see that here's that org.xml.sacs. Up higher, we had that javax.xml package. So this is where they come from. So the interface that we promised that we were ultimately implementing was called what? Yeah, the content handler. So let's start there. So down in the list of classes, we've got content handler, which is actually an interface, hence it's italicized. So here's the interface. And notice already, there's a bunch of other stuff here that we'll wave our hands at. But guess who implements this? That guy called default handler, which again is just open squiggly, close squiggly for every one of the methods in the API. What is the API? The API is the collection of methods that you're about to see. And I promise there were more than the five or so we've been dwelling on, but immediately at top, at least we see someone that's familiar, characters, end document, end element. Some of this is the stuff we've been waving our hands at, ignorable white space and so forth. And for the most part, we'll continue to wave our hands at it because it's there and if you are sort of in doubt as to whether you can do something with the API, that's when it's useful to actually look at the Java doc. And class and so forth will sort of push at you the most useful stuff. And then we have down here, start document and start element. Again, you have their signatures. If we scroll down to the Java doc, for instance, for start element, you'll see very similar explanations of each of these uh, parameters, what a queue name really is and so forth. But for the most part, it's there for reference. Um, for, the most part, you'll, you, for the most part, you can infer from some of these demonstrations, to be honest, exactly how these things should operate. But again, Javadoc, if it isn't already, will become your friend for a course and for content like this. So what does it mean to implement a content handler? It means to implement each of these several methods. Who implements this content handler interface already? The default handler. And that's literally a class whose first line of the file is probably public class default handler implements content handler. And then it proceeds to enumerate all of these methods and the correct signatures and the return values, implements them with open squiggly, close squiggly, and we built upon that code by extending that class. And that's pretty much it for now for using the SACS API. A more interesting question, of course, will become why would you want to use it and what will you use it for? And for that, we'll turn our attention to project one. But before that, let's just formalize and sort of lay the, the foundation for what project one is all about. So entitled My First Parser, the project is ultimately about providing you with a, a fairly complete framework for an XML parser, but a simplified parser. What we did in this project is borrowed pretty much all of the names of these interfaces and classes, but threw away the distractions. Forget about QName. Let's just call the name of the element the name. We're not going to support these things called namespaces. We're just going to support element names. We do have a content handler, but it has far fewer methods and it has simpler signatures for each of them. We have a default handler, just as similar, but simplified. So essentially, project one is representative, certainly, of the spirit of the whole JAXP interface, or part of the JAXP interface, certainly with respect to DOM and SACS. But it tries to push away the distractions so that you can really feel comfortable with the idea of, one, writing software that processes XML, but really getting comfortable with it and realizing if you need more than our simplified interface offers, it really is as simple as just looking things up as you go and knowing, having the comfort or the confidence to actually go do so. So it's about implementing a parser or part thereof. We've provided you with a very limited parser that unfortunately does understand characters and elements and tags and closed tags, but doesn't know anything about attributes. So one of the first challenges in the project is to build upon our own code and actually implement support for attributes. And there are a couple of other aspects of the project as well that allow, ask you to redress certain shortcomings. For instance, our parser fails in its current form on this example three for the sole reason that our parser assumes that the very first character in the document, naively, is going to be your root element. That is the, the, the topmost element in the document. That single backslash n up there breaks our parser. But just considering how best to implement that is sort of one of the, the questions, if simple questions, asked early on in the project. So formally, and just to flesh out 
our conversation of parsing before. The definition of parsing is essentially to take a language, or an instance thereof, into small components that can be analyzed. And I'll read this just so we get the formality out of the way. For example, parsing the sentence would involve dividing it into words and phrases and identifying the type of each component, whether it's a noun, adjective, verb, and so forth. What does it mean in the context of XML? What well, it just means taking that document, reading it top to bottom, and again, identifying the sort of salient uh, entities therein. The, uh, the conceptual entities therein. The start of an element, the end of an element, perhaps an equal sign if you're sort of building from the basics up to what it means to be an attribute value pair, and so forth. Really just processing an XML document and making sense of what really are just ASCII characters or Unicode characters. So how do you know how to parse a document in the first place? That is to say, you can certainly glance at an XML document, especially if you're a programmer, and just get an intuitive sense of what it means to be an XML document. Right? You can sort of detect intuitively what the structure of that thing is. And certainly when we've spelled out what it means to be a PI and a comment and an element, well then you as a programmer know more formally what it means to be an XML document. But we didn't necessarily specify in words exactly what that document structurally needs to look like. And you could do it in words, but it's sort of simpler to do it in what's called a grammar. If you've taken automata theory or uh, um, uh, computer science computation theory and so forth, you're probably familiar with grammars in one or more forms. The specification for XML, as well as some of its derivatives, use these things called grammars to just specify very concisely but very correctly what some language's structure must be. So Bacchus now our form is the form that the W3C uses to define these so-called grammars. But essentially, a grammar is a bunch of symbols and rules. The grammar tells you what kinds of characters can appear in your document or your language. And the rules tell you in what order they can or must appear. So to get a more intuitive sense of this, this would be a grammar for what we know as arithmetic equations. In other words, we have here a definition for it looks like four different concepts. So these are symbols, really, that we're going to use to represent conceptual entities. This stands for equation, term, operator, value. Well, what is an equation in general? Well, an arithmetic equation is a term followed by an equal sign followed by a term. That's an equation. But now we have to sort of explode one of those placeholders and ask ourselves, well, what's a term? Well, a term is defined by its own rule. A term equals an open parenthesis, we'll say, followed by another term, an operator, another term, followed by a closed parenthesis. And we're going to use parentheses just so that we enforce order of operations. Although in reality, and if you're not sticking to a formal grammar, we know that certain operators have priority. But we're going to ignore that fact and you go with parentheses for clarity. Or a term, quite simply, could be a value, like the number two. It doesn't need to be a complicated substructure. Well, what is an operator? Well, this guy's easy. It's a plus, or, a minus, or, divide, or, multiply. Finally, what's a value? It's just any number. And you could define this more formally, but frankly, that too gets the point across. Any number. We'll, say, we'll assume in decimal. But again, sort of a simplified grammar, but a precise grammar. This is to say, if you were to implement one of those HP infix notation, or prefix notation, or postfix notation calculators, and you had a grammar for the types of arithmetic equations that you want to be able to understand when the user punches them in, well, pretty much what that involves is writing a method that parses each type of symbol or entity. And we'll see how to translate this in just a moment. What, other, um, what are some of the instances of a, a language generated by this grammar? Well, just to make it more clear, all of these instances are possible from this given grammar. And you could sort of figure out, if you really wanted to, exactly what rules got applied and in what order to generate these samples. But that's all, right? An arithmetic equation, we know it's pretty, a pretty sort of self-evident concept these days. But if you really want to define it precisely or yourself implement a calculator, be it physically or in software, well, you would have to know what the formal definition is. And a grammar offers us exactly that. So how can we define XML? How can we summarize what we did verbally and with PowerPoint slides in a very concise grammar? Well, we could capture much of XML's features 
any of XML's features with just this definition. And this is pretty much the definition we'll use, slightly modified in project one, so that you can really keep your eye on the ball, so to speak, and really keep your eye on the interesting aspects of XML as we build on top of these basics, rather than dealing with some of the nuances of PIs and stuff that just aren't that interesting on day one. Well, in XML, there are elements, there are tags, start tags, end tags, there's content, and let's say that's it. There are no comments, there are no PIs, just the juicy stuff for now. So what's an element? Well, an element is just a start tag, followed by content, followed by an end tag. And we know conceptually earlier that content can take different forms. It can be empty, it can be another element, it can be characters. So somehow we're going to have to capture that definition in this grammar. Well, what can content be? Well, it can be an element or character data. In fact, we're using regular expression syntax here. It can be zero or more instances thereof because by having this, this allows us to have that category of content called the what? Called what? Our mixed content, as we called it, right? Because if you can have zero or more instances of elements or character data back and forth in any order because of the zero or more, well, then you can build up strings that have, for instance, the uh, hyperlinks inside, the boldface tags inside, and so forth. This just lets you have zero or more instances of either of these. And if you're not familiar with regular expression syntax, certainly pick that up on your own or ask questions offline. Well, what's a start tag? This guy's easy. A start tag is simply open bracket, name, close bracket. Looks like we're really cutting corners. We don't even support attributes yet, but that's what project one is partially about. What's an end tag? Same thing, but you have the slash in front of the name. Well, what's a name? Well, name, we just defined a bit more verbosely just so we could, um, just so we could be more, uh, just so we could get the obvious out of the way. Name is one or more characters excluding that bracket, and character data is zero or more characters excluded, excluding open bracket. And again, this is a simplified grammar for XML, very similar to what you'll be using or assuming in project one. You can look in the W3C's document for the XML spec for the actual grammar. And in fact, an interesting way, or perhaps to simply emphasize the availability of this kind of information, this is sort of the structure that all of these recommendations have. And I went to the course's website now, resources page, the XML category, and the first link there is the W3C's specification, aka recommendation for XML in its latest form. Uh, we can scroll through and you can see that it's a pretty thorough document, but just to give you a glimpse of things, notice here syntax very similar to what we're talking about. Grammar's in this form where a document consists of this stuff and it's already clearly a little more complicated than our simplified form, but it's got stuff like prologues and restricted characters, sort of technical details that aren't terribly enlightening. But we define, the W3C defines what a character content is. If we fast forward, you can see what S means, where S defines white space, consists of tab, form feed, new line character, and so forth. Here things get a little more interesting. What's a name? Well, the point here is that similarly is XML itself very precisely but very succinctly defined. And it's defined in this recommendation using precisely the same syntax. So being comfortable with our simplified form really allows you to bootstrap yourself to a comfort, hopefully, with just what's otherwise more uh, scarier on first glance. But at the end of the day, it's just more complicated because it tries to do more and needs to define more. So why is this useful? When it comes to writing a parser, for a language such as this that uses a grammar defined in this way, writing the parser really boils down to, at least in simple form, to just writing one method for each of those different types of definitions, one method for each of those rules as we've seen them. Here's a uh, method for parsing a start tag. Here's, an element for, here's a method for parsing an element. Well, just think intuitively. If you implement a method to parse an element, what methods is that method in turn presumably going to call? Start the method for parsing a start tag, an s tag, and the, the method for parsing a n tag or e tag. In other words, out of that very basic grammar, do you sort of have hints as to how to go about writing a program that parses the document in the first place? Just write a method for each of those rules, the presumption being any time on the right-hand side, 
you see that an element, for instance, can contain a start tag. Well, what that means is that the implementation for parsing an element is presumably itself going to call the method for parsing a start tag, and in turn, the method for parsing content, and in turn, the method for parsing end tags. What does that mean? Well, that means you better go implement a method for parsing a start tag. How do you do that? Well, you look at its definition, and the method that we'll write for parsing a start tag is going to look first for an open bracket. And as soon as it sees it, it's going to start eating up additional characters until it sees a white space or another bracket. And it's going to assume, hey, that sequence of characters I just encountered is the start tag's name. And as soon as that same method encounters the close bracket, it's going to assume, ah, I am now done. And assuming it didn't encounter any errors, it can now call that event handler called start elements. So things are all connected here, and the code makes things more clear. And we'll come back to my first parser's code in just a moment. But just know, just to keep things slightly formal, inherent in the idea of parsing can be said to be at least these two processes, this idea of tokenizing and this idea of recognizing, where the process of tokening, tokenizing in parsing in general means taking characters from your file or from your stream of characters and just building them up into um, so in what are called tokens, where an equal sign itself might be an individual token. But FOO itself, that might be a token. It's the token that is a tag's name. F in and of itself, not that interesting. FO, but it's FOO. It's the combination, the collection of those three characters that collectively represent a token, that is a start tag's name. So tokenizing sort of takes what's otherwise just a bunch of Unicode characters and groups them into conceptually related entities. Recognizing, meanwhile, per, per our conversation earlier about the distinction between syntax and semantics, well, recognizing means a, taking a stream of tokens like foo equal sign bar and assuming or realizing that foo is the name of an attribute and bar is the value of that attribute because of the equal sign token in between. So in short, just know that this process of parsing does have some formalities around it. And certainly, if you write your own parser for some other language, whether it's a parser for XML or some programming language, an interpreted language, they tend to follow these general approaches. In my first parser, we don't really worry so much about these formalities and trying to keep things distinct as you might in a programming languages class, a theory class. Rather, we just sort of combine them and focus on the intuition behind what it means to parse without getting bogged down in some of those details. But realize that there is a bit more formality that adds complexity and adds utility, but doesn't really add, I think, a, offer a better understanding of the ideas that are important to us. What my first XML parser is, and will soon be even more so once you've had a stab at it, is an example of a recursive descent parser, which operates pretty much like this. You write, as I said before, a method or a function that's responsible for parsing what are what's called a non-terminal. And a non-terminal was each of those things we called symbols earlier, like s tag and e tag. Those were non-terminals. And they're non-terminals in the sense that they all had right-hand sides of those rules. They all become something else. What was an example then of a terminal? Something, sorry? Uh, so an s tag itself was made up of open bracket, name, close bracket. So one terminal was anything that was in quotes, right? Like an open bracket is and always is an open bracket. It doesn't become something else. It doesn't, uh, you don't need, it can't become something else by way of a rule. Similarly, is the name of an element a terminal? It's really a sequence of terminals, a sequence of characters, because they don't extend conceptually or hierarchically deeper, but whereas a start tag does because a start tag has um, conceptual components. So you write a method for each of those non-terminals. You assume that the document already adheres to your grammar, and you take this sort of recursive leap of faith such that the first method you're going to call usually, at least in our context, will be start element. We know, at least in our simplified grammar, that the XML we're dealing with must start with one and only one root element. We're even going to assume, very naively, that that element's going to start on the first line's first character. And we're just going to call start element and let it do its thing. And that's fine, 
so long as the document is actually so in accordance with your expectations. Part of project one is about fixing what a savvy person would call bugs, not features, but simplifications. It was our first pass at a parser. Um, the correct alternation in a rule, that is, recall from our rules that the left-hand side could sometimes become different things. A content non-terminal could become an element or character data back and forth. So the question then is for you, the person writing the parser, how do you know if the next thing you're about to encounter is character data or it's an element? Well, in XML, in our simplified form, it's kind of obvious. If you've just encountered a start tag and therefore know to expect content next per line one, how do you know if that content is in the start of a new element or it's character content, char data? If you see a less than sign, that is your visual cue that you are to process not character data, but another element. And so the neat thing and the, the efficient thing about this kind of grammar and this kind of parsing is that you only need a look ahead buffer, as it's called, usually of just one or two characters. And that means that you, your parser, really can do in constant time, the um, in purely linear time, the parsing of this document. Because you don't have to, for instance, read ahead in the document and realize, ooh, I goofed. I misinterpreted what this document structure is, and then I have to rewind, which might give you something like quadratic or something polynomial in the uh, running time for the parsing of that document. If you only have to look ahead one or two characters and then proceed, it's a much more efficient approach than one that inherently might have you going forward in the document and backward. And it's efficient not only in time, but in space. Because what this means also for our SACS parser is once we've read a character, we never look back. And in that regard, it's very space efficient and it's efficient in that we can even parse an XML document as it's coming in off the wire. That is off a network connection because we just read a character by character and once a character is behind us, we don't have to look back because we only need to ever look one or two characters ahead before we figure out what to do which means we can have two variables, a char and another char, to keep track of those two characters. We don't need to keep the whole document around. So, um, oh, when, what do you do when the document does not meet your expectations? Well, that's where exception handling comes in. And that's why even in our first examples tonight, SACS demo, did we see a big try block and a catch block to handle any exceptions to our expectations. So, here we are my first parser. So what I'd like to do here in class is to give you a sense of one, what the project's about, and two, where you need to go. If you'd like to stick around for a bit after class, we'll do more of a hold, uh, hand holding, if you will, more of a casual Q&A and really hone in on any areas of interest to you personally. Um, this part in lecture is meant to give you the high level overview and enough background and comfort so that come the end of tonight, you can really dive in and bite off over the next several days, next week or so, a good 50% of the project. And the latter 50% is more about DOM, or 25% of the project's about DOM, which is assumed once you, we've had next week's lecture. So with that said, let's take a look at the source code. And one of the sort of side effects of this class, especially for those of you with relatively less Java experience, is that as a side effect of spending time with Java and its related APIs, you really start to play immediately with fairly, relatively large code distributions. Certainly large compared to, for instance, introduction to programming classes, which usually had you writing programs that were maybe this big in a single file. Rather, with project one here, if you haven't looked already, we give you a whole bunch a file, some of which, granted, are HTML files, Javadoc, that were automatically generated, but all of the source code that we've provided you with in the source tree collectively implements two packages. And we'll try to use, what we try to do in this class too, especially for those of you who haven't used Java so much in a full-time basis, is try to acclimate you to uh, industry standards, if you will, as to what tools to use when developing slightly more a slightly larger or more interesting projects than you might be used to, using conventions as best we can as to how to lay the code out and the structure and so forth. So what you'll hopefully get as a side effect too of these projects is just a uh, sort of frameworks, sample frameworks as, has to, as to how you might start implementing your own projects outside of the class. So in this directory, as in some future projects, are a few directories. Docs, which is where our Java docs end up, 
samples, which is just uh, sample code that we give you, which isn't necessarily all of the test cases, as we warn in the spec, but some test cases that at least give you a place to start testing your code. The source tree, but then also the build file. So how many of you have never used ant before? Okay, so a few of you. Fortunately, it's pretty simple. And if you started playing with the project already, using ant is pretty as simple as typing A-N-T, enter. Because what we give you with the, this project and all future projects, actually, save the final project, is a so-called build file. This is a file called build.xml. Curiously enough, it's an XML format itself. So this is an instance of useful configuration files written in XML. And this is the Java equivalent, or one Java equivalent of make, or nmake, or gmake, if you're familiar with any of those in the Unix system. And it's simply a tool, ant, that automates the process of compiling your software, such that in this class, rarely, if ever, for the project, should you ever manually type the command Java C if only because it's slightly annoying to type Java C space and then a long package name, plus to do that for multiple files, it's much easier, frankly, to type ANT enter and have that program figure out what files need to be recompiled. So it does some nice tricks like checking with the last modification times and so forth so that it makes your process of developing more efficient. The top of this file is an example of one little something called, a little trivia, this is called the Something, <laughs> good. This is the XML declaration. This is obviously a comment. Things are wrapping a little ugly because the font is pretty wide, but here are just some comments from us as to what's in this file. Um, we won't spend time so much on the syntax of ant files since officially you won't have to modify them yourself, but if you'd like to learn more about this tool and what it might do for you, besides looking at the manual online for ant, which I believe we have linked on our software page, just infer, frankly, from a lot of the elements in here. And I'll give you just one example. If you, just to get a sense of how this thing works, an ant file, it, among other things, contains targets. And targets allow you to define commands or uh, subcommands you can type at the prompt. So what this means is that if you just type ant, by default, this init target is going to be invoked, sort of by nature. The init method, for instance, does some stuff with timestamping, which is useful for checking what files have been modified. And then it makes a build directory if you don't have one already. And this is a variable defined higher up in a not terribly interesting way. Here we have another target called compile tester. Note that tester, if you've read the spec, is the name of one of the programs that we have you use for project one. And these lines here, all of these attributes in this uh, child element, simply automate the process of building, compiling all of the code relevant to that program. Because that program itself uses some of our other source code, one of our packages. So in short, this file just automates the process of building your code and hopefully expedites the whole process. And if you will rarely, if ever, need to modify it yourself. But it's a useful trick to pick up. So if I want to compile project one, I type ant. And through a series of steps, ANTS figures out from that build file what to compile. And at the end, hopefully it'll say build successful. If you get errors, they'll be indicated here, often with line numbers and so forth, so you know what code to go fix. With that said, let's dive into the code. In our source tree is the juicy stuff. We've kept things hierarchically defined. And in this MF for my first subdirectory, pretty much are the guts of my first parser. Um, we won't spend time walking through all of these files. What the project tries to do is walk you somewhat through these files, but once you're familiar with a couple of them, it's not a huge mental leap to sort of figure out what might be of interest to you next, just to familiarize yourself with. And though there's a lot of files here, especially for those of you without a huge amount of Java experience, most of them pretty short. It's just meant to keep things nice and neat in that we've defined multiple classes like this. Notice in particular that these things are named identically or almost identically to the JAXP API that we've started looking at tonight. So we have a content handler. We have a default handler. But it's simpler. Just to put this into perspective, let's open content handler. Notice it's an interface. And notice that it has a characters method, an end document method, an end element, start document, start element. What's one thing of note, though, with start element? None of that Q name stuff, no namespace. We just strip away the complexity and just say at the core, an XML element has a name and has some attributes. And so our so-called simplified XML API 
only hones in on that. What does default handler do? Well, default handler implements this interface. It also implements another interface that the project mentions, I believe, called error handler. That's just Jaxp's standardization of how to handle errors. And that too is implicit in some of the source code and its comments. Notice that here we have an implementation of characters, start document, start element, end document, so forth, terribly uninteresting, right? Because all of them are implemented with open squiggly, close squiggly. But as a result, they're implemented. And so now we can actually extend default handler in an interesting way. The main file for my first parser is this class called XML parser. And it's here that we'll spend our remaining time tonight giving you a sense of how this parser is structured, what remains for you to do, and just generally how it operates. Conceptually though, this parser, XML parser.java, works precisely along the lines that we've discussed tonight. It is a naive recursive descent parser that certainly now makes some assumptions that causes it to break. It, in fact, it only works currently on 1.xml and 2.xml. 3 through 8 are there as representative of the types of problems it doesn't yet solve and that are left to you. So realize too in this code are um, usually we try to err on the side of keeping things simple rather than always keeping them as efficient as possible or as robust as possible, which is to say what this parser will do first and foremost when reading an XML document, it reads the entire thing into a string all at once. That's useful for our purposes because we can just assume now that an XML document's parsing is just about walking through that array of characters or that string. Right? Simple, probably not very wise if you're parsing documents that are megabytes or gigabyte in size. So gigabyte, you probably shouldn't be using XML in the first place. But the point though is that we again try to err on the side of simplicity rather than all of the correct design decisions for say a real world enterprise type software. So just appreciate those those um, decisions along the way. So what does this parser have? Well, it's got just a couple of private data members. One is this string that's just going to store the whole XML document for simplicity and convenience. It's always right there at our fingertips. Two, it's going to have a reference to the handler. That's useful because we want to keep track of who to call when we're parsing this document. Right? We're going to register with this parser just like we did in our SACS demo whatever content handler the person's interested in. It's to be clear, it's that tester program I alluded to earlier that is going to be sort of like our SAX demo. It's that tester program that one, will instantiate a SAX parser or an XML parser and two, is going to instantiate a content handler and pass them, pass one to the other so that the parsing happens as before. Okay. With that said, the last thing here is just this integer index, which just keeps a finger on that string as to where we are in our XML file. And for the most part, it only goes forward, this index. So it just helps us keep track of where we are. So with that said, what is perhaps the first method of interest? Well, it's this parse method. Just like with the, other, the official API, this parse routine takes two arguments. One is the file name to parse, and two is a reference to the handler that you want to use. Now content handler, or in this case a default handler, again keeping things simple. So what do we need to keep track of when parsing a document? Well it looks like we've got some uh, local variables here to keep track of some pieces of data, but let's dive in to the juicy part here. So the parse method simply uses some rather annoying Java syntax to read the entire file into a string. What we've achieved by this line here is we have in this string called data the entire file. And this syntax is not terribly enlightening, certainly not particularly germane to XML, it's just Java file handling. So we'll turn our attention here. At this point we now have our entire XML file in memory. So look at this. Our parse method is as simple, dare say naive, as three lines of code. It makes that uh, recursive descent leap of faith assuming that not, oh, this is one a valid document and the very first thing in this document is an element. So we have a read element method and as soon as you're done reading the root element, how many root elements can there be? Well just one, so the next thing you're going to do after reading an element at this level in the document is going to be to end the document. So wherein lies the recursion presumably? It's got to be in there. 
All right? Reading an element must itself have the ability to call itself for children elements. Well, let's start there. What does a read element do? Again, I've stripped off the comments in my view of the code, but on your printout of uh, Project 3 source code, you have the inline comments. So again, we try to just do it intuitively, and we set out to implement this parser on first pass just by making those very naive assumptions and doing some very basic checks. So if the first thing we encounter upon trying to read an element is not a start tag, well, I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to error. And I'm going to error by calling fatal error, which is the only method in that interface that I called error handler. So that's just the conventional way, the way we're going to push you toward triggering an error, just so that the person who is using you knows that the error happened. Currently, as you'll see, fatal error has a null implementation. It doesn't do anything. So currently in the code, when errors happen that are invoked by way of fatal error, you don't see anything. You don't get a stack trace. It's up to you if you want to modify fatal error to do something more interesting and more useful. Rather, our program, if it can't read a file, apparently prints nothing to the screen and just quits, which probably is not terribly useful, but it's meant to be your opportunity to go fill in what blanks that will be useful for you to use. All right, well, let's assume that it is a start tag. So we haven't thrown an error, so we proceed to read the element. What's the first thing we want to read in an element? It's start tag. And again, don't conflate start tag with element. Start tag is part of an element, but an element also has content and an end tag. So really, the three things we're going to do is read the start tag, read content, which can be either more elements or text, AKA mixed content, and the last thing we're going to read is the end tag. So let's dive in here. What does it mean to read a start tag? Well, reading a start tag is, can be implemented in the following way. And again, the code looks weird here with no comments. And your printout, again, you have more of a, a fleshed out version. Here's a string initialized to null just so we can keep track of the characters that collectively should constitute our element's name. We're going to increment our index because what have we just read upon reading a start tag first? Open bracket. So simply by incrementing this little counter, are we effectively moving forward in the document? Very simple, very naive way, but gets the job done for our purposes. Well, what do you have to do? Well, so long as you don't encounter this sort of indicative, you know, indicative token, this open bracket, you want to assume that all of these characters are part of the element's name simplified, potentially incorrect approach, but assuming the document's correct, that is right. And we're just going to keep appending or concatenating each character we encounter to this variable called name, incrementing our index, until we do encounter this thing. When this loop breaks, why do we increment plus plus once more? That has the effect of reading in, so to speak, that close bracket. At that point, what do we do? Well, at that point, we've read open bracket, name, close bracket. So conceptually, we have just read the start of an element. It is now our job to pass the buck back to the guy who called us by calling that registered event handler's start element method. So what you're seeing now by way of our parser, we started tonight by looking sort of at the, the higher level developer's view of the world of using the SACS API. Now we're looking from the other direction completely, from uh, downwards on up, at how the triggering of those events is actually implemented in a parser. I call this event handler. I don't know. I don't care what happens. All I'm doing is informing him of the name of that element. Unfortunately, I'm not bothering to inform him of any attributes. In fact, this loop does not obviously support attributes. So, so your first, um, one of your first areas of attack in the source code is going to be in this read start tag method. If again, you're going to satisfy the goal of implementing support for attributes, right? Just conceptually, what are you going to be looking for? Not just close bracket, but also what other useful indicators in order to parse attributes. Spaces, because that's what's going to separate the tag name from the attributes. Equal signs, presumably. Quotes. So it's sort of a, a more interesting problem to solve parsing of attributes than just the names, which is a pretty, uh, a relatively easier task. All right, well, think back in your mental stack here. What called read start tag? 
read element. So let's scroll back up there. Read element, when we last spoke, had us here. We dove in. Think of us as a verbal debugger here. We dove in, stepped into this method. Now we're out. Now what do we want to do? Well, while we're not reading an end tag, how do we know it's an end tag? One, two characters. Our look ahead buffer, two characters in that case. That too is an efficiency uh, uh, guarantee. So what do we do? While it's not an end tag, well, if it's a start tag, we'll go read the element that's suggested. If it's not a start tag, what else could it be? Just PC data, character data. Go read text. What is, how does read text work? Well, read text, scrolling down alphabetically, it's pretty simple. It too starts with a little variable so we can build up the contents of this text while the data at our current index does not equal the start of an element, which is the only, or the start of a tag rather. That means everything between here and there is going to be character data. Let's just keep concatenating it to our local variable, increment our counter, equivalent to reading it, and when we're finally done, call the guy who called us and let him know that a character's event has just been fired. So in short, and I won't dwell on all of the code because at least now by having this sort of bootstrapping verbally here, you should have a sense of one, just where to begin with the code and what code you might want to walk yourself through. Take note again that the tester program is what actually tests this code by way of instantiating a parser and instantiating a content handler. But what you'll realize over the course of project one, as well as in our discussion next time, that the SACS API has some wonderful upsides, right? It's really a quick and dirty API if by just implementing one or maybe five methods and using extending someone else's default implementation, you can really get an application up and running that somehow parses an XML document. And project one is going to have you use the SACS API, specifically Xerxes, which is again that de, de facto implementation, a standard implementation of it, to parse an XML document. But they're relatively fast. That's the upside. If you never have to look backwards and only have to look one or two characters ahead, that lends itself to an efficient implementation. It's useful for large documents because by nature you don't have to or need to keep them around in memory. But unfortunately, the downside is that there are a number of applications it's not going to solve. You can absolutely come up with, and we'll do this next week, scenarios in which you kind of want or need to keep that XML data or just your data in memory because you might want to cross-reference things, you might want to modify the data, and it's not sufficient to quote unquote fire and forget as is the case with the SACS API. And so it's with those limitations that you'll begin to stumble across over the course of this week's development, which pretty much the per first half of project one, that we'll realize that we probably want another option. And that option will be the DOM API, which represents again our XML not as a stream of characters meant to be fired and forgotten as events, but as a tree in memory. So with that said, let's officially adjourn and I will meet those interested in room 204 down the hall for more casual Q&A about the project.